Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. Just before we get started, it would be great if you could put in the chat if you can hear and see me okay. So if you can hear and see me, just put a quick yes. Um, and also be sure to say hello and let us know where you're. Thanks, Monster, loud and clear, great. Say hello, let us know where you're connecting from. Tell us what part of the country or the world you're in. Um, I'm here in Madrid. So my name's Neil Ainsworth and I'm part of the Global Professional Development Team in Oxford University Press. We're gonna be seeing Cheryl soon, who's gonna talk to us about well-being. But before we get started, that's great. Looks like everybody can hear me. Great. Okay, so before we get started, I'm just going to run through a few of the logistical things of the platform. So if you do have any sound or audio problems during the, the session, it's a good idea to make sure you have turned off any um, applications that might require your camera or your mic because they might quit your camera or your mic on this platform. So anything like Teams or Zoom, if you've got any VPNs, I close them off as well. And if you do have problems you can't solve, maybe a good thing to try, just leave the room and come back in again and it might reset everything. Okay, so this webinar is part of Oxford University Press's mission. So as part of the University of Oxford, we're committed to furthering English language learning worldwide. We continuously bring together experience, expertise, and research to create resources, helping millions of learners of English to achieve their potential. And this webinar today is an integral part of that mission. So let's have a look at what we can see on screen. So Cheryl's gonna be sharing her presentation in this part in the slides uh, video section. You're gonna, where you can see me now, you'll see Cheryl in a little while. That's the presenter uh, window. And finally, we have the chat. So I think it's easier if you have questions for Cheryl, don't worry about the Q&A tab, just put everything into the chat and we'll, we'll be able to see them there. It'll be easier. Okay, um, last thing. Yes, we have some um, subtitles as well. So if you'd like to get some subtitles, just click on the CC and you'll see the in the top right hand corner and you'll see the different languages that are available and you can choose Spanish or whatever language you want there. Okay, make just before we start, a few things to tell you about. So we have our Facebook groups. Make, you can join us on our Facebook groups. We have a Facebook group for Infantil and uh, Primaria, as well as one for ESO and Bachillerato. So if you click on the link, you'll be taken there and you can join our groups so you'll be kept up to date with events like this and all our news as well. And also this webinar is part of our Lom Loi Made Easy campaign. So if you'd like to get more information on the different events that we held as part of the Lom Loi Made Easy campaign, click on the link, you'll see all the webinars, interviews, podcasts, and all the different resources that we um, put together there. So it's a great resource ahead of the upcoming um, reform. Okay, so let me just put Cheryl's presentation on screen and then I will introduce her. So we're very lucky to have Cheryl with us today. Um, Cheryl's worked in, in ELT for 30 years. She's been a teacher and teacher trainer in the UK, Germany, Spain, and Ecuador. Uh, she's been a young learner coordinator for the British Council in Quito, an advisor and consultant to the Edu Ecuadorian Ministry of Education and Culture, and a senior editor in the Spanish primary group at Oxford University Press. She's now a freelance author and she's written various OUP primary courses, the most recent being World Class and Open Up. And she is, I'm glad to say, a regular teacher trainer and presents lots of webinars for us here in OUP Spain. So Cheryl, great to have you here today. I'll, uh, I'll be in the background if you need us, but um, other than that, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Neil, and thank you everybody for joining me this afternoon. It's great to be connected with you. And I'm going to be talking about integrating well-being into everyday English teaching. So just a little look at what we're going to do this afternoon. We're going to have a little warm-up activity in a moment. Um, then we'll, I'll do a little introduction to the theme. And then I'm going to take you through <coughs> excuse me, five ways to integrate well-being into everyday English teaching. And then if we've got some time at the end, um, we can do some questions and answers. So as a little warmer then, uh, here are some answers to some questions about me. And I'd like you to see if you can guess what the questions are. So here are some answers about me. Can you guess the questions? Just type in the chat box. 
you don't have to write them all. You can just choose one, write the question number and the question. Any ideas? Okay, Elizabeth, that's a good suggestion. I guess that's for question number one. I'll tell you the answers in a moment. Beer had the same idea. Okay, Raquel suggests how long have you been teaching? Where do you exactly live? Okay, Rosanna, good question. Or where are you from? Could be too. Anyone know what the question for number three must be? Oh, how old are you? Okay, thank you, Elvira. Okay, so Anna suggested a question for, for three. What are you interested in? Okay, or where were you born? Okay, good ideas there. Um, I'm going to tell you the answers now. So I'm, I wasn't actually born, I was actually born near Manchester and that's where I'm from, but I don't live near Manchester now. I live near Oxford. I live in an old town called Abingdon. Um, thank you very much, Elvira, for suggesting that I might be 30. I am a bit older than that, actually. Um, and this is how many years I've worked in English language teaching. So if you were listening to Neil's introduction, you got a little bit of a clue there. Um, and I've been a writer of um, English language courses for about 13 years now. And as Paloma said, what things do you like? That's very similar. My favourite things are coffee, cats and sunflowers. And I'm just going to show you some pictures there to prove these are my favourite things. Some funny pictures of me enjoying coffee, enjoying sunflowers. And in the middle is my cat, Lulu who's doing her favourite thing, which is, of course, sleeping. OK, so let's start thinking about well-being then. And I think a good place to start is a definition of well-being from the Oxford English Dictionary. So this definition is the state of being comfortable, healthy or happy. So when we think about language teaching and whether well-being has anything to do with language teaching, I think this definition is really useful because it stands to reason that these are the conditions which are best for students to learn in, aren't they? <clears throat> and recently, um, all around on the internet, there's been some very consistent pieces of advice about how to improve or maintain our mental or emotional well-being. Um, so these are the five pieces of advice from the NHS, that's the National Health Service in the UK, but very, very similar pieces of, of advice from lots of places. Um, and these are the importance of connecting with other people, being physically active, learning new skills, giving to others and paying attention to the present moment or mindfulness. And actually, uh, one of OUP's new courses, Open Up, uh, of which I am a co-author, has at its heart, really, five ways to well-being. And these are influenced very much by these quite popular um, pieces of advice about well-being. Um, some names have changed a little bit to make them a little bit more um, relevant, really, to English language teaching. And you'll notice that instead of having be physically active, we have instead take part. And this is so that we can be inclusive of all our students and think more about playing a part in all kinds of activities, whether physical or not. So we have a little monkey character that shows us these ways to well-being in the early levels of open up. And then these change to children in levels three and four and icons in level five and six. So I'm going to re be referring a little bit to these ways to well-being as we go through. And of course, very importantly, we're also going to be thinking a little bit about the long lowe because some of the key competencies have a lot to do with well-being, in particular, the personal, social and learning to learn competence and also in many ways, citizenship as well. OK, so. 
the number one way that we can uh, integrate well-being into language teaching is, of course, to help students to bond with each other and with us as teachers as well. And it's important, first of all, to think about why bonding or connecting is so important. Um, and really, it's important to remember that humans are, of course, innately um, social animals and in our ancestors, for example, needed to connect with each other in order to survive. And for those of us who don't live in tribes anymore, we still need to uh, connect with each other to, to survive. And I think in the recent pandemic, this is something that was really highlighted and a lot of mental health advice was really given to try to prevent um, loneliness and isolation, which can of course be harmful to our mental health or emotional well-being. This is a quote from the American podcast host and uh, author Brenny Brown about connection. She says, connection is the energy that is created between people when they feel seen, heard and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment. And I think that's very important to take on board. Of course, one of the ways which we can most easily um, help students to bond with each other is by use, making the most of personalized speaking activities. This kind of thing, I'm sure that you're used to seeing in your course books where students have opportunity to ask and answer questions about their own real lives. And it's quite important to notice the distinction between speaking practice activities like the one at the top, which is really about practicing vocabulary and grammar and students getting their mouth around the new language. And of course, that's important in language teaching too. But this kind of activity alone is not going to help students to bond with each other, whereas a personalized communicative speaking practice activity like the one you can see at the bottom of the screen is going to help children or young learners find out more about each other and that's going to help them bond. But we don't always just need to use things like that. We can, we can look for lots of opportunities, very quick activities um, to help students to bond with each other. So for example, if we're talking about food in the class classroom, we can just say, you know, ask for a show of hands. So who prefers pizza? Who prefers pasta, for example? Or it could be with anything, couldn't it? It could be cats, who, you know, cat or dog, etc. And the reason why this is bonding, actually, is because students like to see who is also choosing the same. So when they put their hands up, they want to see who else put their hands up for pizza. And that's building a bond, isn't it? Children like to look for similarities with other people. Now, remember that um, Brené Brown said that there's this importance about feeling seen, heard and valued. And I think when students do these kinds of activities where they are um, finding out about each other, it's really important for us as teachers to listen carefully. If they're working in pairs or small groups, we should go and listen a little bit too. Because when we find out about our stu students, when we remember what they say, we can refer back to this when there's an opportunity and that makes students feel seen, heard and valued. So, for example, we might hear that Santi has a dog and then the next time we're talking about animals, we could say, oh, um, Santi, you have a dog, don't you? We can remember that. Or if we heard that Anna is learning to play the piano and we're talking about music, we can say, oh, Anna, you play, the, you play the piano, don't you? So this kind of thing um, really helps, I think, make connections, which is, of course, an important way to well-being. It's not, these activities don't just help with forming connections, but they're also about giving to others. Because when we listen carefully to students, when we give them our attention, our full attention, and our interest and our patience, what we're doing is modeling 
to the other children in the class that this is something, you know, that is a good idea, it's a good example. And giving is also about caring, and caring is also about openness and respect, um, which is where on another way that this way to this way of bonding in the classroom um, can help with well-being. Now, Brené Brown also said that it's important for people to be able to give and receive without judgment. Um, and I think this is really key that we need to try to reserve our own judgment. And again, this can be in quite simple ways. For example, if young learners are talking about pets and the pets they'd like to have, if somebody says, oh, I want to have a tarantula or I want to have a snake, for example, if we react by saying, oh, no, that's terrible. A snake or a tarantula is a horrible pet. If we react like this, in a way, we're kind of showing a judgment. And there's a possibility that that student may not express an opinion another time. That's just a silly example. But you see what I mean, that it's quite important sometimes that we try to reserve our judgment so that students feel comfortable expressing themselves. And also, we should remember to join in too. You know, when students are talking about the pet they'd like to have, we can tell them what pet we'd like to have or what pet we we have already. Um, and that's why I told you something about me at the beginning. Um, it really helps um, with building a rapport with students when we tell them about something that we have in common with them. Um, and a lot of the time I'm asked questions by teachers about how to motivate students. And for me, one of the most important things is that bond with the teacher, between the teacher and the students. OK, so another important way that, that we can make, that we can integrate well-being into English language teaching is making the most of fiction and non-fiction. This is going to be quite a long section because there's a lot to say here. Something that I'm quite interested in is just the idea of reading and reading for pleasure. Um, and I was interested to find this information, which comes from a study by MindLab International um, a few years ago, which found that reading can reduce stress levels by as much as 68%. It's quite significant. And actually, that's more than listening to music, which is 61%. Having a cup of tea, which is very British, I know, which is 54 percent, or even going for a walk, which was 42 percent. And the study also found that participants who engaged in only six minutes of reading experienced a slowed heart rate and reduced muscle tension. So it's quite interesting to think about that. So perhaps one thing we can think about is trying to encourage children to read for pleasure um, so we can have story time for example uh, with younger learners or set up a reading scheme or book club uh, in your school and Neil gave me some information earlier about the kind of reading scenes that you you have already um, if you are users of OUP materials you have readers through the Active Learning Kit, which comes with your digital offer. And if you want more books, more titles, you can do this through the Oxford Reading Club as well, which is a monthly subscription. But also, you know, you probably have some books in your school already. Um, you know, encouraging children to read is a really good idea. Um, one thing we should take into consideration is that for some students, who maybe have uh, specific learning differences like dyslexia and dyspraxia, um, we don't want them to find reading stressful um, because if it's challenging, perhaps because of um, sort of working memory situations, um, then the possibility is it's also possible, of course, to find e-readers uh, with books with sound, for example, or audio books or something like that. <clears throat> OK, we're going to do a poll. I always get really excited when I can do a poll. So I hope you're ready. So I've got a question for you. And the question is, have you heard of the phrase windows, mirrors and sliding glass doors 
with reference to children's books. So I'm just going to start this poll. Uh, it doesn't matter if you haven't heard of them. I'm just really interested to know, have you heard of the phrase windows, mirrors and sliding glass doors? It's fine if you haven't. It's really exciting, isn't it? I love looking at the poll results. <laughs> okay, so, well, I, I don't, it looks like the vast majority of you haven't actually, which is good because this is a learning situation, isn't it? So that's, that's a good thing. OK, let's close that now. So we're going to talk about that now. So the idea of stories of, as windows and mirrors, I think, originated with somebody called Emily Stile. Um, but it's become more famous now um, because of Rudine Sims Bishop, who's talked about this a lot. And she also added the idea of sliding glass doors. So what is all this about? Well, a story is a window when it gives children a view into somebody else's experience. So stories are kind of magical transportation devices, aren't they? Uh, which allow children to connect with people that they wouldn't normally be able to connect with, or also it helps them to connect with them better. So this could be people of different ethnicities to the reader, or people of different cultures, or people who live in different countries, for example. Very often, this phrase is used to talk about um, culture. This is a quote from an author of um, children's books called Grace Lynn, who did a TED talk in 2016 called The Windows and Mirrors of Your Child's Bookshelf. And she said, how can we expect kids to get along with others in this world, to empathize, to share, if they never see outside of themselves? Which is very true. Now, what is a sliding glass door then? So a window gives you a view, perhaps, of a different world for example, but a story which is a sliding glass door lets children step inside and actually enter the story. And this can change a child's perspective and also challenge previously held assumptions um, or stereotypes, for example, because stories really help to develop empathy. When we read or listen to a story, we step into the shoes of a character, we experience their life, we kind of walk around in their life. And this is not only um, children that do this. I think we do this too, don't we? When you read a book, do you, in your mind, imagine that you are the character and you are walking around in their life for a while? Um, I definitely do that. Um, and it can help us, we, it means that we see things from their viewpoint. And it's interesting that yesterday I joined a, a Facebook Live event from OUP, um, which was uh, hosted with by Neil uh, with the author Jer Jeremy Bowl. And he, they were talking exactly about this. This has a lot to do with mediation. They were talking about mediation for secondary students. And in fact, there is an activity in the Global Skills Toolkit, uh, which you have access to, uh, which is about this exactly so that's quite interesting so we've talked about the importance of giving to others as a way to well-being and of course um, this is something that um, you know happens definitely when we're talking about um, empathy and emotional intelligence and of, again of course we're talking about that personal and social aspect of the, of this competence in the Lomloe, as well as citizenship as well. So now I've got a question for you. So we've talked about stories as windows and sliding glass doors. So how do you think, how are stories like mirrors? What do you think? How might a story be like a mirror? 
Any ideas? It's very quiet. Okay, nice idea. Autobiographical could be. Or they are, yeah, okay, all the answers are coming in now. You see yourself in the story, Teresa, that's right. Or you stories in which you identify yourself. Or they help you understand yourself better, that's right. They can reflect back your own experiences. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you've definitely all got it there. Thank you. Suddenly, it's funny with Big Marcus. Suddenly, the answers suddenly appear <laughs> just when you're starting to panic that nobody's there. <laughs> OK, so as many of you have already said, a story which is a mirror reflects a child's own culture and reality. Um, when we see, ch see characters in stories, when children see characters in stories who are like themselves, it gives them a sense of belonging and identity. Now, this is really important because for many years, there's been a problem really, that children have not always been able to see themselves on the pages of books, because we very often, unfortunately, had characters that are white and able-bodied and middle-class, for example. And about time, this is starting to change really. And this is very important, which you can see in this uh, quote from a newspaper, which says that the struggle to find characters who look similar or share similar characteristics or circumstances can impact a child's engagement with reading and its lifelong benefits, said the NLT, that's the National Literacy Trust. Just one book a child really connects with can spark a love of reading, which can change their life story and help them to succeed in school and in life. And so what does this mean for us? It means that when we tell students stories or even give them texts about um, real people, for example, what we need to do is, is choose stories with varied cultural settings and characters of varied ethnicities or choose a course book which has these. And you can see some um, little snippets from World Class, which takes very seriously the importance of having stories with different kinds of settings and characters of different ethnicities. But of course, culture and ethnicity is not the only way that we need to be inclusive in stories. Um, we can be inclusive in other ways, in terms of ability and disability, um, physical difference, facial difference, for example, because it's so important for children to see themselves on the page. Um, I'm just showing the, co the cover of a well-being journal now. The Open Up series has uh, a well-being journal in the back of the class book for levels one and two and for other levels in the back of the activity book. And for levels three and four and five and six, there are children characters. And these children characters that you can see here on the screen, they are representative of different children. So you'll notice straight away, of course, that they are different ethnicities, but also importantly, they're different shapes and sizes because very often children in books, they're all the same sort of height and build really. Um, so this is important to show this. And you might notice also that Camilla has a limb difference and that Ryan has a facial difference because he has a birthmark under his eye. And when you're using materials like this, of course, for some children, it's going to be a mirror. For other children, it's going to be a window or a sliding glass door. <clears throat> now, there are other ways that... Um, children connect with fictional characters who are like themselves. And this is just the nature of fiction, really, isn't it? For good fiction to work, characters have to be believable. They children have to be able to relate to characters. So this means that characters can't be perfect because nobody is perfect in real life, are they? So when children connect with characters who have similar difficulties or problems to themselves or messy emotions, because emotions are always messy. Um, this can be very reassuring for children and very affirming. And similarly, for fiction to work, 
there always needs to be some sort of problem or challenge, really. You don't get a story where everything's perfect at the beginning and everything's perfect at the end. Um, and then, you know, all along the story, everything is, um, you know, wonderful and perfect. That's not a story. That's not a really boring story. You have to have a plot. You have to have a narrative arc like this or some up and down twist like this. And that's like life, isn't it? Life is not perfect. So when children see how characters try to solve problems or manage difficult emotions, it can be very helpful and inspiring. Um, this is so it's important when we use texts or uh, stories with students that we use follow up activities which really focus the students on these important messages. Um, this is an example of a story from World Class. Um, which is from level four, which is about a family night. And the family have planned to spend the night together and they're going to watch television together, but the television's broken. Mm -mm. So one of the children is really disappointed about this. This is the kind of thing that we understand um, that, you know, coping with disappointment, dealing with disappointment is something that children need to learn to do. So there's a little feature in world class which is called Think, Feel, Grow. And this gives students the opportunity to think about characters, think about their own feelings, and then maybe use this as a way to grow in terms of emotional intelligence and emotional self-regulation. And in fact, all the stories in World Class have some kind of emotional well-being theme. Um, here's another example, but this is from Open Up now. So I'll just set the scene for you. You don't need to read the story. But this is a situation where some children are in an art class at school and they're drawing animals. So Robbie is trying to draw a chicken. And first of all, he draws a very funny chicken and his friend laughs at his chicken. So then Robbie gets a bit cross a bit angry, and he screws up his paper and throws it down. Then he tries again, but he makes a mistake. So he's trying to rub out his mistake with an eraser, and he rubs so hard that he makes a big hole in his paper. So then, poor Robbie, he tries to do some painting, and this time he accidentally drops some paint, so he has a trickle of pink paint on his paper. So it's not going very well for poor Robbie. And then his friend comes to help. So what do you think happens next? What do you think happens next? Any ideas? What, what does Robbie do next or what does the friend do to help? <laughs> OK, so... Beer says she shows him her picture and it looks terrible too. So this could happen to anyone. That's quite a good message. I like that idea. Anybody else? Okay, well, I'll show you because I'm a bit conscious of time. So this is actually what happens next. Um, his friend shows him that actually he could use the hole in the paper to make the mouth of a cow. And he could use the dribble of pink paint to make the tail of a mouse. And so then Robbie has an idea and he thinks he could use a screwed up piece of paper to make the body of a white curly llama. So, of course, the, what this story is about is about resilience and it's about being resourceful, isn't it? It's showing that sometimes when you make a mistake, mistakes can be very creative. And the way that this is highlighted is through monkey. So you can probably see at the bottom of the page there, monkey is then prompting the students to think about, you know, how do you feel when you make a mistake? 
So, of course, what this is about, which way this is about, way to well-being this is about, is about taking notice, taking notice of your feelings. But this also has something to do with keeping learning, because if we're not afraid of mistakes, we'll keep learning. And that has a lot to do with the learning to learn competence of the long lowing. Here's another activity idea. This is a story character, Pippi Longstocking. If you've heard of Pippi Longstocking, say yes in the chat box. Um, you can do this activity with any character. It could be a story character or it could be a real life character. What the students have to do after reading or listening about this character is to identify words that describe them. Bear's heard of Pippi Longstocking. Good, I'm glad some people have. Um, so they have to think about some words that would describe this character. But what they're going to notice when they start to think of the which of these words describe the character, what they're going to notice is that some adjectives contradict each other. So, for example, Pippi Longstocking is very strong. At least she says that she's the strongest girl in the world and she can hold a horse with one hand, for example. That's strong. <laughs> uh, but Pippi Longstocking is also gentle because when there is a problem in the school with bullying, Pippi doesn't solve it with strength. She doesn't stop solve it with physical strength. She doesn't um, fight, for example. She, um, she solves this problem in a gentle way. So that's really interesting, isn't it? Pippi is strong and she's gentle. And there are many more examples as well. This is really useful because it teaches students that people are not, that labels are not useful. Sometimes in society, we use labels. They happen sometimes in families. You hear people saying, oh, you know, she's the clever one in the family. You hear things like that, or sometimes in the classroom as well, um, you hear, you know, he's the naughty one or she's the noisy one, for example. But people are not one thing. And it's really important for students to understand this. And this is part of well-being because it's about connection. If you understand that people are not one thing and that they may be different in one way, but they could be similar in some other ways, this is really going to help your future relationships with other people. And another follow-up activity which you could use, sometimes after reading a book or a story, we do a sort of traditional book review or story review. And I think it's nice to add a little step, like I've written on the bookmark here, something I want to remember, because that could be something that you have learned which is going to help you with your own emotional intelligence and therefore is going to help you in some ways with your future happiness. OK, so any ideas who this is? We're going to look at some fiction now, uh, non-fiction now, because we've talked a lot about fiction. So any idea who this is? I've noticed there's quite a big delay, so I have to <laughs> wait for you for a moment and have some water. Yes, Elvira, straight away. Yes, that's right. It was the apple, wasn't it, that gave you the clue, I think. Yes, yes, a lot of you got it now. Yep. Oh, you're going too fast, so I can't say your names, but you have got it. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to tell you something about Isaac Newton. OK, so this is a true story. So Isaac Newton was born in 1643 in Lincolnshire, England, three months after his father died. His mother remarried and left him with his grandparents. He had a lonely and unhappy childhood, but when he was 10 years old, he went away to school. He didn't do very well at school, but he started making mechanical models. In 1661, his family sent him to Cambridge University to study law. However, he didn't study law. Instead, he enjoyed studying maths and the discoveries of famous scientists like Galileo. In 1665, the plague broke out. The university had to close and Newton returned home. During the year of the plague, Newton read and experimented. In 1666, he made many important discoveries, 
which is why 1666 is called his miracle year. Okay, so we quite often use biographies, real life stories, things like this in the classroom, especially when we want to practice past tense. And we might sometimes ask students to use or make a timeline. Now, what's important here is that we quite often, when we're talking about successful or famous people, we put all the key achievements and successes on the timeline. We don't necessarily put more of the life experiences on the timeline. And I think it's really important that we show these and think about these. Because again, like a true, like a, a, a good fiction story, life doesn't go, woo, wonderful, everything fantastic. No, it goes like this, up and down, up and down, up and down. So when we think about Isaac Newton, for example, he was born in Lincolnshire and then his mum left. And so he had a really unhappy childhood. But then he went away to school, but then he didn't like school. But then he made mechanical models, which was great. But then he had to go to university to study law. But he didn't study law, he studied maths. And he was really enjoying it. And then the plague broke out and the university closed. Which sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it, really? But, so he could have gone home and just done nothing. He didn't like being at home, but no, he read, he experimented, and a year later, is it's his miracle year. You know, so this teaches us students a lot about, uh, you know, the lives of real people. And sometimes a life like this reminds me of a snakes and ladder board game, because, you know, life's a bit like up a ladder, down a snake. This is life, isn't it? So we could make a kind of game with templates where students write parts or act, uh, things that happened in someone's life and maybe organize them in order or something like that. And that will highlight them, uh, highlight to them um, some of the important things about well-being, about understanding the importance of keeping learning and uh, resilience and things like that. Now, we kind of touched on the next point, which is um, how we can integrate well-being into our teaching is to try as much as possible to help students grow a growth mindset. Now, this is a photograph of my very well thumbed copy of Dr. Carol Dweck's book, Mindset. Um, Dr. Carol Dweck found that people have two kinds of mindset, a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And she discovered this through years of research into achievement and success of secondary students. Now, I'm not going to go all the way through this because it will take a long time. So let's focus on the characteristics of a growth mindset and what they are. So if you have a growth mindset, then you believe that abilities and talents can always change and develop. And if you have a growth mindset, you don't try to get away from challenges or avoid challenges. You welcome challenges and you try new things. You believe as well that you can always improve if you practice and practice is really important. And you also don't mind making mistakes because you recognize that mistakes are not only normal, but really useful ways to learn. And people with a growth mindset also really appreciate feedback. Um, it doesn't make them feel bad or uncomfortable. They like to be given feedback. And also they don't feel daunted by other people's success. It doesn't make them feel bad. They find other people's success inspiring. Okay, so these are quite um, interesting things to think about. In recent years, there's been some criticism of growth mindset. And this is really because maybe in some ways it appears not to be very inclusive. So perhaps in a socioeconomical way, for example. So, you know, it would be hard really to become a famous composer if you didn't have access to a, a piano. Yes, we're going to talk about mistakes in a minute. That's a good point that you're bringing up there. Um, so, you know, there are some things like that, but I think we just have to take it. It doesn't mean that anyone can do anything if they just have a growth mindset. It's just that these 
suggestions are really quite help, helpful, especially in terms of language learning, because it helps students to keep learning, which kind of taps into this idea of learning new skills and also learning to learn from the uh, Lom Loe. So one key thing that we can do is to be quite careful what we say in the classroom, because sometimes we say things which are actually demonstrated a fixed mindset and not a growth mindset. So, for example, we might say some of these things and rather than saying, I'm really bad at drawing, I wish I could salsa dance, I can't do that, or that's too difficult for me. We can think about kind of changing that to something which demonstrates more of a growth mindset. So if we say instead, I need to practice drawing, that shows that we value practice and we know that practice is important. And the problem with I wish is it sounds like an impossible, doesn't it? But not always, but much of the time, if you really want to learn something, you can learn it or something similar, you know, that normally, not everything, of course. So perhaps we can say instead, I want to learn how to salsa dance, for example. There's also this magic little word, yet. Instead of saying, I can't do that, we can say, oh, I can't do that yet, which suggests that there is some possibility of being able to do it in the future. And rather than saying that something is too difficult for us, we can say that, oh, uh, I can't do it that way yet, <laughs> but I can try doing it a different way, for example. So doing this is really helpful in that it's modeling uh, to students a growth mindset. Maybe they might pick it up a little bit. And I'm really conscious after the last couple of uh, years um, that students might have heard a lot of expressions, a lot of phrases which sound quite like fixed mindset. Um, you know, maybe they've overheard people talking at home, for example, things like the, the uh, speech bubbles on the left there, they've lost a whole year of education, they'll never catch up, or, you know, maybe when they're doing their homework, you know, concentrate, don't you realise how much time you've already lost? So maybe in the classroom sometimes or when we're teaching online, we need to try and redress that balance a little bit using sort of growth mindset messages a little bit more. You know, I can see you're trying really hard. You know, if you keep practicing, I think, you know, you're going to make a lot of improvement or, well, don't worry, we're going to do lots of practice or maybe, you know, OK, this is not working for you very well at the moment. Let's try it a different way. Um, and we can also, of course, try to encourage students to change the way they talk as well, using more growth mindset phrases instead of, you know, fixed mindset phrases. So, of course, the growth mindset phrases are on the right there. Um, and some, you can make a poster or something like that if you teach in the same classroom and refer students to it to remind them at any opportunity. And to be honest, you don't really have to do this in Spanish, in, in English, if you don't want to, because it's such an important thing which is going to affect their learning of English, that even if you do this in students' own language, it's going to help them learning anything. Um, another thing we can do is to show students that we feel comfortable with where they are in their learning. Because I think the last two years are going to mean that we're going to see much more mixed ability in our classrooms, much more mixed ability. And we're going to have to be, try to be comfortable with it. This is just something that's going to have happened in every country, I think, from the effects of homeschooling or missing school. So one, one thing we can do is when we ask a question to the group, instead of students putting up their hands if they know the answer, Everyone can put up their hands holding a card. Green means I know the answer. Orange means, well, I'm not sure. And red means I don't know the answer, which means that if you put up the orange card, there's no pressure because you're just trying, you're being brave. And if you put up, hand up, put up the red card and they see that you're comfortable with that, then you know they maybe will feel a little bit more braver next time. And you can do the same thing when students are sitting, working independently, 
perhaps doing a writing activity or, you know, a grammar activity. If you put a little card, they can put a little card in front of them so you know who might need some help. Um, and this is an important little feature that I wanted to show you, um, that um, in the review section of World Class, students have to see which words and things that they remember. And then they have an activity there. You can see number two is check lesson one and three for the words you can't remember and write a list. So the students are doing review here, but they don't get into trouble if they can't remember all the words. They're encouraged to keep learning. So it's like, OK, just check. Are there any words you can't remember? OK, write a list of them and then focus on them. So we're encouraging students not to hide what they're not good at. Um, you know, not to hide this at all, just to find a way to keep learning, keep going. Everything's fine, you know. So I guess this brings us on to our next way of incorporating well-being in the young learner classroom. And that is trying to be as flexible as we can be. And one of the things that we can do in this respect is to take into consideration that emotions and feelings are not nice and tidy, but very, very messy. And one of the reasons why they are messy, according to Paul Gilbert, the, um, he's a clinical psychologist who wrote a book called The Compassionate Mind. He says that these feelings are like they are. I'm glad you think it's important, Phil. <laughs> um, I think that, um, sorry, I lost my thread then. Yes, so Paul Gilbert talks about the fact that humans have tricky brains, and tricky means difficult brains. And the reason why we have difficult brains is because they have not really fully developed enough for life in the 21st century. So our brains have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years, and some parts of our brains are still really old. Um, and these old ancient parts of our brain, they give us our threat system, um, which is important. They, in the past, they kept us safe from danger. And, you know, they still will keep us safe from danger if we were in a real emergency. But we also have newer parts of our brain, which are the frontal lobes. And these parts of our brains, um, they make us uniquely human. They make us different from animals. Um, and these are really good parts of the brain because they give us things like imagination and language and the ability to plan and solve problems. Lots of really great things. But we do sometimes have a bit of a problem when the old parts of the brain and the new parts of the brain kind of start working together and hook up. So Paul Gilbert um, has an analogy for this, which is about zebra. And it's very helpful to show it to, under, to help us understand this idea. And I heard the uh, clinical psychologist, Dr. Kate Breerton, talking about this a couple of years ago. So imagine zebra on an African plain. Very happy there on an African plain. Suddenly a lion appears. And one of the zebra senses this and sends out an alarm signal to the rest of the herd. So what happens then? Of course, the zebra's threat system in their brain is triggered. There's a surge of adrenaline. And of course, all the zebra go charging off, running as fast as they can to safety. And what happens next? 10 minutes later, ah, oh, they're all fine drinking water, maybe in a water hole, all of them are feeling completely fine. What they're not doing is this. This is what zebras would do if they had our brains. And so you can see what we're dealing with. Where sometimes we may need our threat system in a case of a real emergency, but we don't, fortunately, we don't have too many of those. We don't see lions every day. Um, but unfortunately, it also gets triggered by things which are not actual real emergencies. And once we get into this sort of loop, it causes problems. So I guess what I'm talking about is that it's important that we remember that all our students have tricky brains. And, you know, they can't help 
their emotions and definitely their feelings affect them sometimes and their ability to learn. So what can we do? Well, one thing we can do, of course, is to teach students to express their feelings in English and to do that quite early on. You know, and of course, we can support feelings vocabulary with pictures like pictures, emojis, for example, or a poster like this one from World Class, or with images or mime or gestures or actions. And we can check in with them, ask them how they're feeling, you know, as often as possible. And the most important thing about doing that is that we're showing students that we know that we all have feelings and emotions. And we know that feelings and emotions are normal and natural, even the negative ones. And that is really sort of validating feelings and can be very reassuring to children. And it can be quite useful as well in terms of practicing English language, um, combining feelings with other things. Um, learning about our, how our feelings affect our behavior is really important because this is going to make children sort of notice their own feelings and how it affects their own behavior. But it will also help them form friendships because they will understand that the feelings of other people sometimes um, affect their behavior. So this is another story. This is a story from one of the well-being journals from Open Up where Jaden suddenly gets really angry on a school trip and starts having a tantrum and gets really cross. And then the teacher realizes oh, he's hungry. It's because he's hungry. And then the children have opportunity to think about what they do and how they behave. Um, but also feelings are quite often, you know, we can teach them together with colours because we quite often use colours as a way to talk about feelings. And we can also talk about parts of the body with feelings because, of course, recognising different parts of the body uh, where we feel feelings, where emotions begin. Um, this is quite useful too and very useful vocabulary, of course. OK, and we can also try to be flexible in terms of trying to read the room, um, which means noticing, understanding and being sensitive to the mood or the feelings of the group that we're teaching. Um, so sometimes we need to notice, actually, the students are a bit lively today. They're not ready to focus. And some activities which are very similar in some ways to mindfulness are very good settling activities because they encourage children to take notice. So this includes things like visualization activities where you show students a picture and then you sort of talk them through, ask them questions about what they can see, hear, smell, feel, etc. And children don't answer the questions out loud, they just answer the questions in their head as they imagine themselves in a situation. Um, and there's an activity like this actually in Open Up, which has sound effects and a photograph, which works in the same way. And we can also use quiet settling activities as well, uh, which involve concentration, like listening for one minute, for example, to anything you can hear. And this activity works really well online because students are in different places so they can hear different things and then they can report back the different things that they can they heard, for example. So it's good vocab practice, too. There are also breathing routines that students can do. This is five finger breathing when the students breathe in and out as they go around their hand. These little tricks are quite nice things to learn and also settle the class or yoga, for example, lots of activities, yoga activities for children on the uh, internet, including yoga breathing, again, which is very calming. So all these things are really about paying attention to the present moment or uh, mindfulness as well. <clears throat> and also, of course, we can use music sometimes as well, uh, calming music or energizing music because sometimes when children are very very lively um, then um, it's quite a good idea um, to you know let them let off steam rather than just try and settle them and quiet them down straight away um, and we can do this not just at the beginning of the lesson but also in the middle of a lesson um, because that will give students a brain break for a moment as well 
Um, okay, so we're getting a little bit short of time now. Shall I carry on for another five minutes or would you like me to wrap up? So I can wrap up, wrap up a bit quicker if you prefer. There's no problem, Cheryl, if you want to go for five more minutes. Yeah, it probably will be just under five minutes, okay? No so another way in which we can be flexible is to try to cater for mixability by giving students choices. Oh, thank you, Bea, I'm going to carry on. So um, we t I mentioned already that we are going to find ourselves in the situation where we have much more mixed ability in the classroom. And <laughs> it's just going to be exhausting if we try to fight it. So we're going to have to just try to, we're going to have to try to manage it. You know, we're going to, even though it's going to be difficult for us and it's going to cause us to have, you know, problems with our tricky brains. So I think choices are a really good way to manage this. So there are different ways that we can have give to students choices in the classroom. Now, I don't mean that they're going to completely take control of the classroom because that would be terrible. Uh, so that's not a good idea. But sometimes giving them some responsibility or agency is quite useful. So just small things, for example, in the way that you begin or end the lesson. So, for example, you could say to the students, mm, do you want to play a game or do you want to sing a song to start the lesson, for example? Or the order in which you do things as well, I think is important as well. Um, so, for example, sometimes you have to do something in the classroom which the students don't like so much. Maybe something like checking homework or something like that. So you could ask the students, OK, today we need to check the homework and we're also going to watch a video. Do you want to check the homework first or watch the video first? And this gives them a little bit of responsibility because it's their choice, isn't it? So it's not any choice, but, you know, a limited number of choices. Similarly, I mentioned reading the room and notice, you know, being sensitive to what's going on in the classroom. And this is difficult sometimes, you know, if we've got to get through some work and we're very busy, you know, it's not always possible. But sometimes if the students are enjoying something, a game or a discussion that started in the classroom, sometimes you can kind of let go of the reins a little bit and go with the flow because this flow when students find themselves in a situation when they're really enjoying something this is one of the important aspects of taking part enjoying what you do is a it's an important um, part of well-being isn't it so if we can do that and similarly if something's not going well at all you know you're trying to teach something and it's really difficult and everybody's struggling maybe they're tired you know maybe sometimes it's possible to say hmm, okay this is feeling a bit too difficult today we're going to do this a different way next week you know if you can i know it's difficult sometimes to be that flexible but you know sometimes if if it's possible um, we can also be give students some choice in the way they do their homework so all our students are different and, you know, it's very likely that you will have some students in your class who have some kind of um, specific learning difference like um, dyspraxia, dyslexia, dyscalculia, for example. If it's hard for these students because of sort of like speed of processing or working memory, if it's hard for these students to write sometimes, and they have to work about 50 times harder than students who don't have these specific learning differences. Maybe they can do their homework a different way. Maybe they can do it digitally, it might be easier. Or can they record their homework? So we could be a bit flexible as well, taking into consideration um, different abilities and you know, having a bit of flexibility in that respect, letting students play to their strengths. And also importantly, there's often more than one way to do an activity or to practice something. You know, there is always a different way. You know, if plan A doesn't work, there's plan B or plan C or plan D or plan E and a lot of letters in the alphabet. So one of my favourite kinds of activities that caters for this is cho choice boards. So this is an example from world class. The students are reviewing what they've learned in the unit, but they can choose how they want to review it. 
So some activities are speaking activities and social activities, which suit some students better. Other activities are writing activities, some are word level, some are sentence level, some are paragraph level. So students can choose in order to play to their strengths. Um, and I know that sometimes this causes a bit of a problem with classroom management if students are doing different activities, because some students might take longer and other students might take less time. But I think it's just a case of giving the students who are fast finishers another one and not, you know, and letting the students doing something that's taking them longer have a bit more time, you know, maybe at the end of the next lesson or something like that. And it's, a, it's just a case of, you know, sort of uh, it's 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 a case of trial and error and trying it out and seeing what happens and reflecting on this. Um, because choices are so important because it shows children that it's the taking part that matters. You know, I know the NHS website is about being physically active, but we've kind of changed that to being active in any way by taking part. It's the taking part that matters. And also sometimes you how you take part is flexible. But the main thing really that we show children is that effort is valued as much as, if not more than, uh, uh, achievement or success or whatever, or ability. That's what the word I was looking for. Right, my last piece of advice about uh, integrating well-being is looking after number one. Who is number one? Who do you think number one is? I'm going to just go ahead because there's a bit of a delay. Um, but maybe you don't want to say, but number one is you. And this is a bit counterintuitive for teachers because teachers are by nature very caring. You choose to be a teacher because you care about other people. You want to give to other people. But actually, we can't help other people if we don't take care of ourselves first. And the best example or analogy for this is when you get onto a plane. I haven't been on a plane for a very long time, but when you get on a plane, the flight attendant tells you um, that um, you must put your oxygen mask on yourself first. You mustn't, you will of course want to put it on your children or anybody you're looking after, but you have to put it on yourself first because if you don't put yours on first, you can't help anyone else. And this is a good analogy for life. Yeah, Bea likes that too. So all these things, all these five ways to well-being, they're just as important to you. So if you're remembering to do one or two of them for yourself, try to do some of the others too. So I'm sorry we finished a little bit late. I got a little bit carried away. And sometimes there's a bit of a delay in the chat box. But thank you so much for coming along. It's been wonderful to connect with you. If you want to ask any more, any questions, you're very welcome to ask, ask questions now, if there's anything that you want to say. Thank you, Cheryl. That was so good. So much um, great stuff in there, really, and really practical to, you know, to apply straight away. So, yeah, if you do have questions, um, pop them into the chat and we can have we can have another few minutes to, to answer them. No problem at all. Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind comments. <laughs> thank yes, you. I, think, I think everyone got a lot from that session, Cheryl. So I think everyone will have enjoyed it a lot. I can see from the comments that they did. Oh, thank you. Very good. Okay, well, look, if you do have a question, put it in the chat because we can always pause this and, and come back to the question. But while we're just finishing, let me... Um, Put back up our moderator slides and we can finish up the session. So basically the, the thing that would be great to get would be some of your feedback. So I'm just going to share a link where you can um, click and you can just give a quick uh, feedback survey. It only takes about a minute and it'll give you, you can give us your opinions on what you thought of today's session and maybe give us some ideas on um, what you'd like to see in future sessions as well. 
Um, but other than that, yeah, just I don't think there's any questions, Cheryl. So I think it's just to say, I mean, that must mean you just covered everything fantastically during the session. So thank you very much to you, Cheryl, for, for a great webinar. Thanks to everybody for um, participating and taking part in the in the chat and, and sharing your ideas. And do give us some feedback. Have a quick click on the on the link there. Um, and it would be great to get your ideas. Okay, well, let's leave it there. So thank you, everybody. Um, and hopefully you, we'll see everyone. you again in the next um, uh, webinar. Okay. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Neil.